Um, it took all of 30 minutes for my kids to be completely enfolded into your group. So thank you all for uh, taking care of them. Is that going to work? Is that good? About the same? But do anything different. Anything different? No. It's not. Um, it really, you all don't realize this, but to see kids that are older than them, that they look up to singing and worshiping and having fun and reading their Bibles in the morning, it just, you see my, my daughter sitting up here, Alex, I, I'm sorry, but you might have to take her home with you. Um, <laughs> But it, it just means the world to us, so thank you all. Uh, one of my favorite things about coming on trips like this is not just, like I said last night, us getting to spend time with you all, but you getting to spend time with our kids, and so thank you. Uh, you all told jokes in the in-between time. Lydia has a joke that she always wants me to tell, so she would probably tell it if I let her. Why didn't Anna let Elsa take her balloon? She would let it go. That's good. All right, never mind. Y'all, y'all are hurt. I'm actually going to talk about that a little bit. All right, so this is session two. Uh, last night we talked about the, the design of identity. What was our original purpose? Who are we created to be? Does anyone remember the shift? Remember, we're going to have a shift for each talk. Does anyone remember what that shift was last night? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. From who am I to whose am I? And that whose you are is really important um, because you are created by God in his image. Very good. And we're going to get in today what happens when you stop believing that. When you forget that you belong to God and you think, I only belong to myself. When you, when you don't ask the question, whose am I, but who am I, things go wrong. And we're going to see what happens with Adam and Eve and kind of the destruction of identity. So we're going to pick up where we left off. In Genesis 2, 24 and 25, and kind of read through the temptation in verse 9 in chapter 3. And as we're reading this, just kind of picture yourself as Adam and Eve in this situation. Um, what they're tempted by, how they respond, and how you kind of see that in your own life and in our world today. So Genesis 2, starting in verse 24. Again, the font is super small. Sorry. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And this is talking about Adam and Eve. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And remember last night we talked about that's that sense of self, sense of worth. They were vulnerable, they were completely known, but they didn't have to be scared about that. They didn't have to pretend they were not ashamed. But here's what happens. Verse 1, chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field, that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for all the gifts of life that you have given us already today. And I pray that you'd open our eyes to see new things in your word this morning. That you open our eyes to see and be exposed to the ways that we hide from you. The ways that we pretend and put on false identities, Lord. I pray that we would be exposed in that. But we are not without hope. And so even more, Lord, I pray that you remind us and ensure us of our hope that we have in Jesus. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So what I'm going to try to convince you of this morning is what, what has gone wrong with the world is directly tied to your identity. Most of our problems in life stem 
from this issue of identity. When someone doesn't know who they are, it can be really devastating. There's a newspaper article in the Washington Post. See, we used to have these things called newspapers. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Um, they were, yeah, these papers you'd get, and there's things written on them. It's crazy. There's a newspaper article in the Washington Post. It was probably five or six years ago. And here was the title of the article, The Irony of Being a Human Being. And in that story, the author covered two events that happened on the same day in a hotel in New York City. And here were those two events. They're both really sad. In the first story, a young woman was sitting alone in a hotel room. She had left her husband and two children to run off with another man. And that evening, her new partner had deserted her too. And she had left, and the police came in that room because she had been missing, and they found a desperation note on her nightstand. And here's what that note said. Don't cry for me. I'm not even a human anymore. That's the first story. Downstairs in that hotel room, in the, in the, in the ballroom there, another event was taking place. There was a gathering there of a self-help conference where a popular celebrity speaker was trying to help people think more positively about themselves. And so he stood up and he led the, the enormous crowd in a chant, and that chant was, you are a God, you are a God, you are a God. And the article finished with this line. The irony of being a human being is that people in the same time, in the same place, have no clue who they are. At one point, they can think, I'm not even a human being, and just downstairs, they can think, I'm a God. Same time, same place, so much confusion. And nothing really has changed for us, has it? Most of our problems in life stem from this idea of we don't know who we are. And this is because what you do in life always flows out of who you are. Your behavior always flows out of your identity. And so we have to get that question right. We saw last night whose we are. We're made in the image of God. We're blessed by God. He calls us good, not because we're so lovable, not because of our performance or how we look or anything like that. He calls us good because we are His. So what has gone wrong for us? We're going to see that in Genesis 3, 1 through 9. And as you saw Genesis 3, this is the start of sin entering into the world. This is called the fall. So Genesis 1 and 2 is creation. Genesis 3 is called the fall because that's when mankind fell into sin. And if you ask what has gone wrong with the world, Genesis 3 is the best place to start. Because in Genesis 3, that's where our relationship with God gets disrupted. disrupted. And when that relationship gets disrupted, everything gets disrupted. So you see there in the beginning, Adam and Eve sin and rebel against God. They don't trust his word. They believe Satan when, when he said, did God actually say? They question his goodness. Is God keeping something from me? They want to not just be like him as an image bearer, but they want to be him. They want to exceed their limits and know things that are not allowed to know. And what is the first thing they do when they sin against God? What is the first thing they do? You see it there. It's, it's very, very interesting. They cover themselves with fig leaves. Did you notice that? That's their first response after their sin is to notice, I'm naked, even though they were before and it wasn't a problem. Now they're ashamed and they feel like I must be covered and they hide. And this, I'm arguing in Genesis 3, is our first attempt at a false identity to not trust in who God has made me to be, but I have to make something of myself. I have to cover. I have to hide. And that's where we're still at today. Adam and Eve, even though this is so long ago, this is exactly what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We, we, we create false identities to cover who we are, to pretend and to hide from God and from others. Most of our problems in our world can be traced right back here to Genesis 3. And so what I want to spend our time doing this morning, and this won't be too long, I think it's on the next slide, yeah, I'm going to talk about two practical ways this works itself out, two false identities that we get ourselves involved with. And you can think of them like fig leaves. 
If you think about this story, fig leaves are really silly. It's really silly to think, I can cover up myself, I can hide from God with fig leaves. But we still do this, and we do it in two major ways. I'm going to walk through these ways and show how they apply to our lives. So the first one is traditional identity. It's kind of the old school way of doing it. Some of you all might really struggle with that. The second way is modern identity. That's the new school way of doing it, and some of us really struggle with that. And we might actually go in between the two. These categories don't come from me. They come from a pastor up in New York City, Tim Keller. And I found that they're really helpful to help different people understand what they're struggling with. So we'll go one by one. Traditional identity, what is that? Traditional identity is you feel like you have to earn your identity through outward duties and performance. So we don't know who we are, so I have to become somebody through performance. That's who I truly am. How do you get your sense of self? How do you get your sense of worth like we talked about last night? You look for some outside stamp of approval, some outside standard to live up to. That could be a parent, that could be a teacher, that could be a friend, a coach, that could even be a a youth group leader, that could be me. You look for some outside stamp of approval and then you live up to that standard through constant performance. So I'll give you an example of what this looks like, especially in high school and middle school. You can think, I am my grade point average. I want to be a really good student. That's where my identity lies. My identity is in my schoolwork. And so I have to constantly perform to keep up with that GPA. Because if if I get a good GPA, I can get into a good college. I can get a good career. I can be really successful. Or you're you're, you're performance in other ways. I'm, I'm I'm an athlete. And so what this looks like for me is I must perform in my sport. So I practice really hard. I try to be the best so I can be successful in the game. I've seen this big time with college students, but I'm sure this is with high school and middle school. I have to live for my parents' approval. They have to think well of me. They have to see me as good. And so I have to do all of what they say with being a great student, being a great son or daughter, being a great athlete. I am my performance. And what I've seen is most people that grew up in church or most Christians, they live out this identity more than a gospel identity. So on, on, on one hand, they believe that Jesus died for their sins, that we could do nothing to earn your salvation, but Jesus had to come to give us his salvation. And that's kind of going on in your offhand. But in the hand that you write with, your operating hand, the one that you do most of your work with, you're believing the world's form of identity. You're believing this, that I must perform to a certain standard for God really to love me, to approve of me. So I go to all these Bible studies. I go to all these youth conferences. I do all the right things, not because God loves me, but but trying to earn his love. We think all the time, if I just obey God, then then I have to be loved and accepted by him. But if I disobey, he's really disappointed in me. And I think a lot of us deep down think God is just putting up with me. That he's in love maybe with a better version of me, maybe a future version of me that has it all together, but he's not into me right now because we believe this traditional identity. We believe our worth is in our performance. Not just with others, but with God too. And what this leaves you with is exhaustion. It leaves you with this feeling that on my good days, I feel really good about myself. I I may even struggle with pride in that sense. Uh, When I'm doing, when I'm checking all the boxes, when I'm doing really good, I feel God really loves me, other people really love me. But on your bad days, when you struggle, when you mess up, when you fall back into old sin or patterns, you feel awful. You feel like I let God down, I've let other people down. And this leaves you in this constant performance trap, this constant cycle of worrying about what God thinks and worrying about what other people think. And over time, you can begin to wonder, am I even saved? Does God still love me? Has his love run out on my struggles? And this identity is everywhere, especially in our culture of performance. Um, but this movie portrayed it really well. I don't know if you all have seen it. Has anyone seen this movie, Crazy Rich Asians? Okay. So, again, I'm dated. I, this, this one's pretty recent, though. Um, it's, PG, it's PG-13, so disclaimers. Um, 
But Crazy Rich Asians is a story about uh, Rachel, and she's an Asian American, but she spent most of her life in America. And Nick Young, who is this super wealthy person from Singapore, and they're in New York, they fall in love, and Nick's mom comes from this traditional identity, which a lot of Asian culture is. It's this honor culture where you have to be about the traditions, about the society, about honoring the family. And she is not a fan of Rachel. She thinks that because she grew up in America, Rachel's way too worried about personal happiness and not about ex external sense of duty to family. And there's one point where Nick takes Rachel back to visit her fa uh, his family in Singapore, and she's meeting the family, she's getting to know them. And there's one scene in particular that sticks out. Rachel feels this disappointment from her future mother-in-law. She's trying to win her over. She's trying to perform up to her standards. And she catches her, her mother on the staircase, and he, she's talking to him. She's talking to her, and Rachel's telling Nick's mother about how much she loves her son. And the mother just looks at her, and she says this, You know you will never be enough. That's what she says to Rachel. And Rachel is obviously devastated. She loves her son. She wants to be with him. But because she does not fit this mold of traditional identity, her mother-in-law says, You will never be enough for my son. And what I've experienced, that's the feeling of traditional identity. If you're caught in that, you have a feeling of, I'm never enough. Because you cannot perform enough. Traditional identity is based on performance. You're having to look out there and perform up to standards. And so you're always having to worry, am I doing enough? Am I good enough? This is a big one, especially for the young ladies in this room. Am I pretty enough? The standards of beauty in our country are so high, they're so ridiculous, and you're always having to worry, am I, am I that pretty? Am I beautiful enough? Am I popular enough? Am I smart enough? And it creates this culture, this world of constant comparison, constant competition with others. And your generation, it's even harder for because you're no longer competing against your classmates, you're having to compete against the whole world because of social media. So every day when you get on your phones, you're looking at all these different standards that you are having to live up to, and you just can't. And that's why traditional identity is exhausting. So that's traditional identity. You have to look outside for what you want to be, and then you have to perform up to it. Because that's so exhausting, many people flip to the new identity. And this is really big in our culture right now, too, in our world. This is modern identity. I'm going to walk you through this. Modern identity is not go earn it out there, it's go create it in here. So instead of looking out there for your identity, you have to look into your heart. Really, what do you feel? What do you desire in your heart? Now go be that. You, here's some common slogans of this identity. Follow your heart. Go find yourself. Just go do you. No one can tell you how to live or what to do except you. No matter what in this world, make sure you be true to yourself. And, and yes, even one of my favorite movies, one of my daughter's favorite movies, Frozen, is all about this modern identity because she goes from what? Conceal, don't feel, to what? Let it go. That is her going from traditional identity to modern identity. Just let it go. Look into your heart, find yourself in there, let it go, and just express it. And you might be thinking, what's so wrong with that? <laughs> that actually sounds pretty good. That's what you hear from everyone. Why, why would I not want to be true to myself? Even I was at Chipotle on the way up here yesterday, and on my Chipotle cup, it said this, you are your own happiness. Even Chipotle. I can't even go to Chipotle and get a burrito without hearing this message of you find your own happiness. You create your own life. So what the modern identity says is the goal of life is to discover and find yourself no matter what others might say or what others might do to challenge that. You've got to find and discover yourself. I'll give you an example of this. This is, again, dating it, but I'm trusting that you, you, you know her. I just don't know if you know this song as well. Taylor Swift, fans? Okay. Um, does anyone know her song, Out of the Woods? 
Yeah. So that's from an old album, 1989. Um, this song, when it came out, Out of the Woods, and I, I really encourage you to go look at the music video. When it came out, it was the most downloaded, viewed music video of all time. I looked at it on YouTube this morning, 175 million views still. So it, it, was, it was extremely popular when it came out. Here, here is how the video starts. It starts with her at the top. She's on a beach. She's looking out, very uh, melancholy. It says she lost him. So talking about her, her boyfriends, all that. When, when the video does that, she's on this island. This, this whole forest grows up behind her, and the whole song is her going through that forest to the other side of the island, trying to make it out of the woods. Hence the name of the song. Very, very clever. She gets to the other side of the song. The music starts getting slower and slower. It goes down. She sees someone on the other side of the island. She goes up to them, pats them on the, on the uh, shoulder. That person turns around and says, she lost him, but she found herself, and somehow that was everything. So she gets to the other part, she pats the person, and it turns out to be herself. And what Taylor Swift is saying there is the whole goal of life is not put your worth in a man, in a boyfriend, because that hurt her. Go to the other side of the island, and you'll find out the true goal of life is to find yourself. She went from traditional identity to modern identity, and this is everywhere. In fact, uh, Olivia Rodrigo is going through this process herself right now. <laughs> yeah. Wait, I'm telling you, I promise you, wait a couple years, and she's, she's talking a lot about the guys right now. They're traitors. They betrayed her. She's going to start talking about finding herself. Watch it. Her next album will be all about finding yourself because that, that's all the world can offer. Go find your identity out there. No, that doesn't work. Now go find your identity in here. You might be thinking, again, what's so wrong with that? This, this identity is so popular, it can be hard to see the problem, the flaws. What's wrong with this? Here's what's wrong with this. Who's the real you? This, this identity is honestly... And this is why I'm so passionate about this, especially with my work with college students. This identity is literally killing the millennial generation, Generation Z, and down. Because to have to find yourself and to create your own identity is setting you up for a lifetime of pressure, a lifetime of anxiety, a lifetime of not knowing who you are. Because if you look into your heart to find your desires, your desires are always changing. They're never the same. Make a connection between modern identity and our current anxiety levels for college students, high school students, middle school students. To earn your identity is hard. To create it is impossible. There's a line in the first Incredibles movie, if you're a fan of the Incredibles, that gets this idea. Incredible Boy is talking to Mr. Incredible at the very beginning, and he says this, and this is the problem with modern identity, which is why we're so stressed out all the time. He says this, he says, you always say be true to yourself, but you never say which self to be true to. And he's talking to Mr. Incredible. You always tell me be true to myself, Mr. Incredible, but you never tell me which part of myself. I have all these selves in here. Sometimes I want to be really athletic. Sometimes I really want to be really smart. Sometimes I want to chase after uh, success. Sometimes I want to chase after a relationship. Who, who am I really in here? Your inward desires are a really good thing. They really are. But to base your whole identity on them leaves you with so much chaos, so much confusion. You're never stable. You're never secure. So those are two options the world gives you. Either traditional identity, earn it through outward performance, or modern identity, create your identity through inward desires. And I would say both are extremely bad ways to live. Traditional identity leaves you exhausted from always having to keep up. Modern identity leaves you always anxious, never knowing who you truly are, always having to create someone new. But notice that the story in Genesis 3, when they cover themselves, is not over. And if Adam and Eve's story is not over, your story is not over either. There has to be a better way, and one of my favorite things about Jesus is the identity he offers in Christ. We're going to get into this really specifically tonight. But just to give you a sample this morning, look back at Genesis 3. Notice that Adam and Eve do hide. 
they feel exposed, and maybe you kind of feel exposed right now. We're laughing about traditional and modern identity and how we've kind of got caught up in that. But we might feel exposed of, I do live like that, and I, I don't know what to do. But Adam and Eve, they hide, but they're like my kids. When my kids hide, they desperately want to be found. And I found that out, too, with students. When students hide, they desperately are looking to be found by somebody. And notice in this passage in Genesis 3, when they run, God goes after them. When we run, God always runs after us. He initiates, and he asks that perfect question, where are you? And when you, see a, when you see a question in Scripture from God, the Father, from Jesus, you have to ask, why is he asking that question? Because God already knows everything. So he must not want the answer. He must be doing something in the person. So when he asks, where are you? He's not looking for their location. He's looking for their heart. And that's the question I want to ask you all this morning. Where are you in all this identity? Have you seen yourself in the traditional identity, trying to earn your way, in the modern identity, trying to create your way? Because here we get to the real problem behind both of these identities. Both of these identities are rooted in yourself. That's the whole temptation in the garden. Satan tempts Adam and Eve, exchange yourself for God. Don't trust in him, trust in yourself. Because if he can get you to exchange yourself for God, he is one. That's the root of sin. We can think of sin like just behavior, but at the bottom of sin is an exchange of yourself for God, and that's what these two identities do. Traditional identity and modern identity are both about getting better. You have to improve yourself constantly, either through earning it or creating it. And here's the second shift I want for your weekend, second heart shift. And this is, again, what separates Christianity from everything else. God is not after a better you, but he's after a new you. That's the hope of Scripture. These other false identities are all about self-improvement, and God has come for redemption. He's come not to make you better, but to make you new. This is why we have hope against our struggles, why we have hope against our sin. Sin is not just what we do. Like I said, we're bound by it. That's why, have you ever tried to stop sinning? It's really hard. Have you ever tried to stop the desires in your heart from wanting the wrong things or loving the wrong things? It's impossible. It's not enough to say, I just need to stop doing these things. Your heart has to be changed. And that's why Christianity isn't about bad people becoming good or even good people becoming better, but about dead people coming alive. That's the whole point of Jesus' cross and his resurrection that we're going to get into tonight. So Christianity... Jesus has not come to make you better. He has come to make you new. And I'll end with a really silly illustration. This actually comes from my pastor, if you can believe that. So there used to be a show, there's a channel called MTV. You all know it. It plays the same show over and over again, uh, that Rob Deerdeck show, Ridiculous. I don't know if they have a special contract, but that's all they play now. They used to play different shows, uh, numerous shows, and one of those shows was a show called Pimp My Ride. And that was a show with, does anyone, does anyone remember that? Okay. Yeah. Uh, the show was a, a rapper named Exhibit. You all have no clue who that is, and you don't need to know. Um, don't even worry about him. The, the idea of the show was the rapper Exhibit, for some reason, would go uh, to these people's houses, and these people would have a kind of an old, junky, run-down car, and he would take that car to a place called West Coast Customs, and they would fix up their car. They would pimp, fix, trick up their rides. And so they would give it brand new paint. They would give it new accessories, DVD player, stereo. Those things were big back then. That's not that special now. Uh, give it really nice leather interior, uh, huge custom rims. Um, they would even do crazy things like put a soda dispenser in the back, fish tank uh, in, the, in the glove compartment, all these things. They, they would just fix up these cars in crazy ways. But what was always ironic about the show was they would do all, they would, the whole show would show them fixing up all this stuff about the car, but you know what it never showed? Them fixing up the engine. <laughs> they would do all this incredible work, fish tanks, paint, rims, interior, and they never actually seemed to touch the one part of the car that makes the car go. 
And so, yes, it's great to have a new paint job, it's great to have new rims, but if the car doesn't go, what's the point? And a lot of people do this with Jesus. They, they want Jesus to make their life better in certain ways, better circumstances, feel better, act better. And so they spend their life, like Pimp My Ride did, in fixing up major things about the car, and the whole time Jesus is saying, I'm trying to get to the engine. I'm trying to get to that newness. It's not about being better. You need to be made new. And that's exactly what Jesus does. C.S. Lewis says it best like he always does. I think I have this, yeah. Christianity at first seems, about, seems to be about morality, rules, guilt, yet it leads you out of that into something beyond. Never confuse mere improvement with redemption. Jesus did not come simply to produce a better you, but a new you. And this is, this is so beautiful. His discipleship is not like teaching a horse to jump higher. It's teaching a horse to fly. That's Christianity. If you came to Christianity, if you came to Jesus thinking, I just want to jump higher, Jesus is going to be really disappointed in you because he's wanting to do something brand new with you, not make you jump higher. He's wanting to make you fly. And that's exactly what we're going to get into tonight. So come back tonight and we'll talk about how exactly Jesus makes us fly. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, we need your help. We need your help so much in so many different ways. We, I, I so much just want to be better. And you have come for a whole new thing. And I, I pray you do that work on our hearts right now. I pray you bless the time in the small groups, Lord. That people would not feel a pressure to pretend or perform but they could talk about you and what you're doing in their lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.